I wish to discuss in this talk two very common complaints, hay fever and asthma. Spasmodic or bronchial asthma and hay fever may be considered together for they represent practically the same condition, differing only in some of their symptoms and in the location of some of their irritation. Hay fever is an acute, usually recurrent and distinctly seasonal inflammation of the nasal mucous membranes, sometimes involving also the conjunctiva of the eyes. The Schneiderian membrane of the nose seems to be more sensitive to irritation than any other membrane equally exposed to dust, pollen, odors, gases, etc. Bronchial asthma is a term applied to a distressing complication of catarrh of the bronchial tubes characterized by difficult and laborious breathing. Whether acute or chronic, asthma develops in those with a pronounced catarrhal diaphysis who are possessed of a peculiarly susceptible nervous system. Its development is always preceded by colds and catarrhal irritations of the mucous membranes of the upper air passages including the nose, pharynx and larynx. Cardiac and renal asthma, the first, a shortness of breath resulting from weakness or disease of the heart, the latter, a similar shortness of breath seen as a late complication in Bright's disease and similar difficulty in breathing seen in certain diseases of the lungs and liver are sufficiently different from spasmodic or bronchial asthma as to make differentiation easy. The difficult breathing seen in late tuberculosis of the lungs will not be mistaken for spasmodic asthma. Because of the invariable association of asthma and hay fever with preceding catarrhal states it is essential that we understand something about colds and other catarrhal affections of the nose and throat. As there is a close relationship between both hay fever and asthma and bronchitis, and all three of these so-called diseases have etiologic factors in common, and in view of the fact that both the basic and the exciting causes of hay fever and asthma are identical or similar, and both these so-called diseases are built upon exactly the same foundation, I feel it essential to include in this discussion of hay fever and asthma a review of catarrhal affections of the upper respiratory passages. Chronic nasal catarrh and hay fever may be considered together even though the first is a chronic and the latter an acute recurring inflammation or irritation of the mucous membranes of the nasal passages. Catarrh of the upper air passages is one of the earliest forms of mucous membrane irritation starting in infancy and continuing through progressive changes in the mucous membranes, the effects of which may stay with us throughout life. Two forms are recognized, the hypertrophic or hypertrophic with thick induration and pulp formation and the atrophic in which there is shrinking of the mucous membranes with or without ulceration and usually a fetid discharge or purulent or mucopurulent secretion. Although this class of cases makes up a large percentage of the specialist clientele, it is assumed that permanent recovery is never attained. Actually, in our experience, it is one of the least difficult of a large number of catarrhal affections to remove. Laryngitis is a catarrhal inflammation, acute or chronic, of the upper part of the windpipe where the vocal cords are situated. Tubercular, syphilitic and carcer can cancerous laryngitis are also described, but we will not discuss these at this present time. The abominable hacking and clearing of the throat, so annoying to the public as also to the sufferer, is frequently the result of chronic laryngeal and pharyngeal irritation due to nothing more than uh, 
the hypoacid condition of the stomach. The acid gases eruptating from the sour food in the stomach give rise to the laryngeal irritation and the production of mucus, which must be expelled by coughing or hawking. A sweet stomach has no need for a hacking sentinel at the entrance. Croup in children is a catarrhal condition with gastric irritation and more or less bronchial spasm. Croupy children do not long remain. Croupy, when the diet is properly suited to their requirements and the food combined in a way to prevent fermentation. Acute bronchitis, commonly referred to as a cold in the chest, is usually an extension of a catarrhal inflammation beginning in the nose and upper part of the throat and then extending into the large bronchial tubes. If the inflammation spreads to the smaller branches of the bronchial tree in the lungs, the condition is known as capillary bronchitis or bronchopneumonia. Because these deeper structures are less easily drained, the condition is more grave than bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis commonly follows the acute form if the latter is not properly cared for and its cause removed. Often there are several crises of acute bronchitis before the condition becomes chronic. There are different types uh, that are classified as mucus catarrh or winter cough with moderate expectoration, bronchorrhea commonly uh, in the elderly with profuse expectoration, fetid bronchitis with decomposition of the secretion, bronchiectasis, dilatation of the bronchi, fibrinous bronchitis with occasional sloughing of the mucous membranes. These diseases make up the greater part of the winter practice of the doctors of all schools of so-called healing and provide a ready market for the cough medicines of all kinds. Relief is afforded by a variety of treatments, none of it permanent for the reason that cause is not removed. Children are likely to develop adenoids and enlarged tonsils, tonsillar inflammation, abscesses, etc. along the way, and nasal polyps are not uncommon. Ulceration and suppuration of the nose, throat, bronchial tubes, etc. are frequent because the circulation through the thickened and devitalized mucous membrane is reduced so that tissues tend to break down. Started early enough, proper diet will prevent such complications as adenoids and enlarged tonsils. In all these cases of catarrh, of the upper air passages, catarrh and fermentation in the stomach are always present even though there may be an ab absence of symptoms to indicate it and toxemia is the ever causative factor. Bronchial or spasmodic asthma may be the end point of any one of several of the bronchial irritations previously discussed. As in hay fever, with which it has many symptoms in common, there is commonly in asthma a hypersensitive condition of the nervous system and a, pre, uh, a pronounced tendency to act promptly and acutely to mucous membrane irritation uh, of dust, pollen, odors, etc. This sensitiveness is called allergy and is supposed to be the cause of the asthma. In reality, it is part of the asthmatic condition. The basic cause of asthma is within. Before I discuss the hygienic theory of cause, let me briefly consider some of the alleged causes that the regular profession bases its treatment upon. All physicians and their subalterns uh, and echoes believe in the exotic origin of disease. They believe that disease can be cured by recognized therapy. The superstition that disease can be cured is thoroughly ingrained in them. No other thought about disease has been taught in our schools and colleges and no other idea is entertained. All else is heresy. 
the most popular medical theory of the cause of asthma and hay fever is that these diseases are allergic and are due to external sources of irritation. The cause of the allergy has not been determined by them. Tests are made to determine what substances a patient is sensitive to and allergens, vaccines made of the causative substances, are given both to prevent and cure the disease. Allergens, vaccines or serums, have been made from almost every animal and vegetable substance on earth, everything that has a taste or smell, with which to treat asthma and hay fever, and the end is not in sight. The horse supplies several kinds of allergens, as the hair on different parts of his body supplies different serums. The, ha the hair of his nose, that of his tail, and that of his body each supplies its own serum. The same is true of geese. A fat chance the asthmatic has of obtaining genu genuine relief from the asthma if he has to wait until the physician has tested all the substances on the earth to which he may be allergic, and then to test all the allergens that may prove of benefit to him. The 150 or more allergens that are injected into the bodies of asthmatics and hay fever sufferers are not as harmful as the morphine injections that are given to asthmatics when physicians become desperate in their desire to provide relief. There is a large class of physicians who think that asthma is due to sinusitis or to pus in the sinuses, and they do not hesitate to disfigure their patients for the great benefit their operations are supposed to provide. They do not hesitate to break into the frontal sinuses and disfigure the patient in a way that will humiliate him for the rest of his life. That this operation does not remedy the asthma seems to make no difference with this class of physicians, for they continue to perform the futile and disfiguring operation to collect their fat fees. While the real cause of hay fever and asthma is endogenous, rising within the body, there are, in many cases, certain definite external irritants carried by the air that precipitate acute exacerbations, while seasonal influences and temperature changes are factors that are not to be ignored. These exciting causes are secondary to the systemic condition that is responsible for the sensitivity of the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, throat, and bronchial tubes. This is the reason that attention to these provides, at best, a little temporary relief from the symptoms, but no genuine recovery. Basically, all so-called diseases are one. All present the same symptoms modified only by the influence of the functions and structures most involved in the pathological process, and are all due to the same blood and flesh condition to which we have given the name toxemia. We readily admit the existence of many different symptom complexes that have been labelled as separate diseases, complexes that physicians have more or less isolated, defined and named as different diseases but we insist that their specific names mean nothing. Asthma and hay fever are endpoints in the more or less general catarrhal condition that has been in most cases years in developing. Normal men and women do not suffer with asthma and hay fever. This much is certain. They are symptom complexes, hence abnormal. If a man or woman is so abnormal that he or she is unable to sleep with his head on a nice soft pillow, pet his cat, or come near to horses without suffering a paroxysm of asthma or hay fever, what should be done? The medical answer, carried to its logical conclusion, would be to destroy all feathers, cats, horses, and other alleged causes of asthma and hay fever, or devise a few hundred serums to provide a temporary and doubtful palliation in a small percentage of these cases. 
as much stupidity and scientific foolishness are displayed in the treatment of asthma and hay fever as in the treatment of colds, tuberculosis, syphilis or other so-called diseases, if instead of talking learnedly about proteins and protein sensitivity and the fallacies that have been built up, up around these, the profession and the people could be induced to forget them and give their attention to the causes that produce the abnormality in the individual, the causes that have been made him hypersensitive, these patients will get well and stay well. Right living is the remedy for both these so-called diseases. There is but one question the asthmatic should decide, namely, does he want to be free from asthma forever, or is he going to be content with temporary questionable relief? If the latter, the medical profession is skilled in giving relief. If the former, he will be compelled to look elsewhere for full recovery. The same position and the same replies apply to hay fever sufferers. To be truly remedial, the care in both chronic catarrh and hay fever must be constitutional. To avoid hay fever next year, measures must be taken this year to effect elimination of toxemia and to provide ample time for re-establishment of normal blood chemistry and must provide for a restoration of normal membrane resistance to external irritation. To do all this, sensitization tests and allergy determinations are not necessary. Food effects are determinable by simpler objects.